And hi, guys. Hello. Uh, I want to very welcome you on my presentation. Uh, I'm Tomek. On everyday basis, I at work at Okado Technology in Wrocław, where I'm the software development manager, which probably already sounds bad, right? Because we have manager on programmers conference. But what I do on everyday basis, I try to help my teams rather than make their life a pain. I'm trying, I'm hoping that I'm achieving that if you we can ask these guys because Piotr is, for example, working with me. So if I'm cheating or lying or something, he will be the first one who stands up and say, that's bullshit. Yeah? <laughs> so I wanted today to invite you for my presentation, which is level up your culture. So we'll be talking, we'll be discussing a little bit about culture we have at Okado. And I wanted to share with you some practices we are doing to make the culture more fun and more engaging for people. And hopefully you will see something which will be a bit inspiring for you. So let's go. Um, and I don't want this. I actually don't want this, pre this, this presentation to be like a boring, regular presentation. I want to do something different. So what I wanted to propose to you today is that I want to play a game. And those of you who are fans of horror movies probably already recognize this quote, right? Like, the Saw movie? Yeah, and that, the game in that movie wasn't really fun, right? It was rather horrific. It was like blood, flash, and guts flying everywhere. So we are not going to play anything like this. We're not going to play this kind of game. I want to play something a bit more pleasant, something more like Angry Birds or stuff like this. And don't, no blood, no flash, no guts, just learning. Okay? So if we are ready, let's hit the start button and play. So our game will consist of levels, will be built of levels. There will be exactly five levels in our game. Each of them will be corresponding to the previous one, somehow corresponding to the next one. In every level, we will be discussing some things, some pieces that actually affect our organizational culture. And also, in every chapter, I will, I will try to share a kind of a practice we established at Okado Technology. We introduced it. And in my opinion, it's working. So if you are guys ready, I think we can start. So let's hit level number one. So level number one. As you can see, this is like not a very friendly place, right? Hot, full of lavas and volcanoes. Maybe not the best place to have your holidays there. So I called this level, at first, there was fire. And what we are going to talk about in here, what kind of a fire? Hey, maybe not, we'll be not talking about fire. We'll be not talking about fire and firing, but mm -hmm, a little game of words about hiring. So not fire, but hire. We'll be talking about hiring, about recruitment processes, and stuff like this. So at first, I have a question for you. If you think about your company, if you think about your organization, what does your recruitment process look like? What answer it gives you? How do you verify that the candidate is the right one? Not only technically, but how do you kind of verify if this candidate is a good fit to your organization, that this is a person you want to work with? And I believe this question, if the person is a good match for your company and for the culture in your company, is exactly as important as if this guy is technically skilled. So I want to say that in general, recruitment process is very important because, guys, you probably recognize this place, at least most of you, yeah? From the Simpsons, this is their home. And home is a very special place, right? In the home, home is a place where you feel safe, right? You feel good. This is the place you want to be. You feel good in there. So if you have your home, you just don't let the bad guys in. Right? And the same is with our organizations. If you want to have happy, good culture, healthy culture, you want to work with cool people, you don't let these bad guys in. And the recruitment process is the way, the good recruitment process is the way this, that actually can distinguish for you guys who you want to let in and this we would like to avoid. Okay? So what I wanted to say is also that this one person actually can be half of your organization. Just actually just like me. Because when I joined Okado Technology in Wrocław, I was among two first hires in Wrocław entirely. Two people was forming at that time when I joined. There, was two, there were two people in Wrocław. So if there was a wrong decision during the recruitment process and I was a jerk, you have half of your organizations being a jerk, which really, really sucks. So this recruitment process is very important. This recruitment process is the way to invite people to your organizations that are valuable, that, that will bring you value, that will make you a better place, not they won't bring you down. This is why recruitment process is important. And especially important is when you hire leaders. 
When you hire leaders, it's even more important because leaders have a big impact. They influence the organization. They shape things. They make decisions, right? So they, the recruitment of leaders is even yet more important. And you have to be extra careful in this. And well, how it looks in other organizations, how it looks usually in some companies, how do you hire a manager, right? So when you hire a manager, this is how it's usually done. If you want to hire a leader, a manager, you take another manager, right? And it, doesn't, it cannot be like a just regular manager. No, if you're hiring a manager, you need a super manager. You need a manager that knows everything, that's super good. You need something like someone who knows everything and is like an uber manager. And this guy starts to do the interviews. He interviewed the candidate. And finally, he says, oh, this guy is super smart. I want to work with him. I'll hire this guy. And then he goes back to the team and says, OK, guys, this is your new boss. And the team is supposed to be like, wow, thank you very much, big boss. You hired the manager for us. Thank you. We are so happy and glad. And, and unfortunately, it usually doesn't work that way because Sometimes these decisions are wrong. The thing is that for this manager, this super uber manager who is hiring another leader, another manager, this guy he hires is just yet another subordinate, yet another person he works with. And actually, by hiring this manager, the most affected people by this decision is the team. Because as I said, for this big boss, this guy is just yet another employee. This is yet another guy he works with. But for the team, this is someone who is shaping their reality. This is someone whose decisions affect their everyday work. So they are super affected. And no one asked them if they want to work with this guy because decisions were made somewhere on the top. And we spotted this problem and decided, nah, this sounds stupid. We have to do it kind of differently, right? If the team is most affected, why don't we ask them the question, who you want to be your, who you want to be your boss? who you want to have as your manager, as your leader. And we decided that we'll introduce a practice this, that in the net I've read that this is called somewhere a mob hiring, but we in general call it interview by the team. Simple idea, how it works? Well, if we want to hire a manager, when we were hiring a manager, we simply invited all people to a team interview, to meet this guy, to ask him very often very tough questions, to know this guy, and we actually do it at the very first stage of an interview, when the candidate is fresh, when he didn't talk with the organization yet, he don't, doesn't know how we work, so he cannot give the right answers. He's fresh, and he has to be, he's saying what is in, in his mind, what he thinks, what is or his values, his priorities, etc., etc. So he gives us this on the very first stage. So he, talk, he talks with the team, and the team can say if they want him or not. And the goal of this interview is very simple. What we want is simply to see if there is chemistry, if this leader and the team, they have this connection, they want to work together. If this guy, in this hour or hour and a half, can build a relation with the team, because if he cannot build a relation with the team, what kind of a leader will he be later on? So the question is, does it work? Yes, I would say it works. It's a cost. We made some changes because now for not for every position we have this team interview in the first stage because of course this takes a lot of time for the team to interview all candidates. But we are still doing this for managers. And does it work? Yes, it works because, come on guys, how many times you've been asked to say if you want this guy to be your boss? I don't, I've never been asked before that. I've never been asked who I want to work with as my boss. It was always like, this is your manager. Thank you very much. Be happy. And now I can say, I, I like this guy. I want to work with him. And it works because when we had candidates who even failed on further stages of the, of the recruitment, people were already asking questions. We like this guy. What's happening with him? And when there was successful recruitment, people simply say, OK, we're waiting for this guy. It's not some new guy who manager tells us you need to work with this guy now. This is guy that they've chosen. They've chosen, they liked, and they want to work with this guy. So okay, I think this is it for level number one. As in Angry Birds, we can give ourselves stars. So uh, as I like to max everything in all the games, so let's give ourselves three stars, of course. And let's go to level number two. So level number two. Level number two is a cold, hard place, right? As you can see. So I call this hard rock induction. Because we've discussed hiring, we've discussed recruitment, and great, right? So now we've hired, perfect, congratulations, but what next? What are you supposed to do now? And the answer is very simple. When you join any company, anything, well, you start with training. 
right? You start with induction, you start with training, and this usually can be hard. This is hard. Why? Because there are so many things you have to learn, right? There are some projects, technologies, tools, processes, practices. You have to learn all this. And it's like so much information that you can think that only Ninja can deal with that stuff. There's so much. And there's a worst message because there is something else. There's even one more, th there's one more thing that people need to learn, that you need to learn joining a company. And this is the business. Learning what your business does. In short words, where the money comes from. It's very, you have to know it, you have to understand it to have the big picture, to understand why your work is needed, why, how this code turns to money. Because then you can propose better solutions and stuff like this. So understanding the business is essential. Understanding the business is essential in our work. But you have to be extra careful. You have to be extra careful because it's yet another thing you have to learn. Plus, I, I, I'm a manager, right? So, but I consider myself being still a kind of technical person, and I know how people react for business, especially we. If the business is like, I don't know, financial, industry, whatever, and it's not super cool, it's usually like when you ask people to learn about the business, talk about the business, it's something like this. This is the phase you can get, all right? We don't want to do these stupid learnings. We don't want to do these stupid courses. This induction is boring. We don't care about it. We want to code, right? We want to write code. We want to do our work. We don't care about this stuff. Plus, plus, usually there is so much information about the business. When you add all this together with the things I've told already, you can feel it's like it's time to run away because there is simply too much information you have to deal with. So the question now is how you can change this, how you can make it more involving, how can you make this, this induction more interesting, more engaging? So what we, maybe, we thought that maybe instead of just looking, letting people look at the business, look at it, read about it and stuff like this, maybe we can let people actually touch our business by their own hands. So what we decided to do is something called job swaps. We introduced the practice. Every person that was joining in Wrocław, especially at the very beginning of the company, when someone was joining our organization, we decided to send them to our headquarters in Hatfield, and there we kind of encouraged them to do the job swaps. Job swap means that you can change your job with anyone else, but not from technology, not from coding. So we have three options here. You can go for a day to our automated warehouses, and do all the work that people do there. You can do picking, you can fulfill customer's order, you can unload trucks with products, you can load our vans going to customer. You are just for one day a warehouse employee. Physical work, pure physical work. Of course, we are very careful with developers not to you know, like hurt their fingers or anything like this. But still, it's not the same. You don't have these targets as people in the warehouse, but still you do the same work. So you see how it's going. Or you can, for example, go for a day, you can go with the driver for a buddy route, and you go through England and you deliver the shopping. And this is a really cool option. Or you can go to our call center, where you sit with the advisor with the headset, and you can actually hear what are the problems that customers are calling. You can actually hear what are they, how are they using our software, how, they are, how we are fulfilling their needs, what are the problems they are having, how our applications are used. So you can see all that from the business perspective. And I must say that I also had this job swap and it was crazily exciting. I was crazy excited, so I started to do stupid things because, for example, uh, sorry, first, the, the quote, this is how, why it works. This is why it works because as Benjamin Franklin said, T tell me and I forget. Teach me and I may remember, and involve me and I learn. So this is what we wanted to achieve. We wanted to involve people in the business, which is usually boring and you don't want to learn about this, but we wanted to involve people so they actually learn and they understand how the business works. And this is working really cool because, as I said, people tend to do stupid things. And as you can see, I'm not kind of a model, <laughs> and I'm definitely not a selfie type, and this is what I did when I was driving through England, because I was so excited that I said, oh, I have to send this to everyone. I'm driving a van in England. I'm delivering shopping. I'm a courier, something like this. You wouldn't be normally proud that you are a courier, right? It's like, no, that might be a dream job. But I was super happy at the moment. And 
when I, I take people, I take people from my teams, I take them to Hatfield, they do the job swaps, and you, when you see what's happening afterwards, when, when after the day we go to a pub having a beer, and people are like, like on this Heineken commercial, it's like, whoa, you know what this guy in the warehouse is doing? You know what the driver does when he this, this, this? And people who are usually technical, geeky people, right? And they don't want to talk about business, they are having a beer and they are discussing the business. And they are super excited with that. So the question is, does it work? Yeah, because, come on, if you look at regular induction stuff, when you have e-learnings, when you have some courses online, or you go for a boring lecture, this is something different. This is something that can actually let you touch the business, see what the people, how the people are using your software. And naturally, when you get involved, you get excited about it, you talk about it, and you learn. You actually know what's happening. You know how the drivers work, you know how warehouse work, you know what call center does, what applications they use, and what our customers' problems are. So does it work? Yeah. Because it, for me, this is a much better way of involving people into your business knowledge. So level number two is done. So let's move to, of course, free stars first, right? We're going for a record. <laughs> OK, and level number three. As you can see, level number three is kind of a jungle, right? Well, so I called it, surprise, surprise, welcome to the jungle. Welcome to the jungle. What can be this jungle in our, in our world? What can be the jungle in our IT world, in our IT organizations? I would say the jungle is where our day-to-day -day work starts. Because you have these tons of meetings, tons of decisions, deadlines, goals you have to fulfill. So this is a madness. This is a jungle, right? Plenty of stuff going on. But I have a kind of a worse message for you. This is not it. Because we tend to focus on projects, right? As, as developers, we focus on our everyday project work. And that's totally fine, because this is what, what they are, why they pay us. But there's so much more. There is so much more than our project. You know, guys, um, we, we think we are kind of in the center, but the truth is that we are rather somewhere there. In our organizations, we have to admit that it's not so simple. We live in a very complex world. IT organizations are complex. They are living organisms, constantly evolving. All this stuff is changing. And there are so many different decisions that affect your work every day. There are so many lines, so many connections that affect your work. Your everyday coding work. There is so much, plenty of other decisions that affect your work. Right? Because someone is setting some standards. I don't know. Uh, the recruitment is a separate process, and it affects your work. The, pay review process, the, the, or HR processes, those are things that affect your work, but they are co coming outside from your project. So what we, well, for example, recruitment, which I mentioned. For, for, for organization, when you have recruitment and hiring one more person here or one more person there, it's usually, you know, just it goes, simply it goes, yeah? But for the team, when you, there is four of you and you get five, fifth person, this is a big change. This is changing your work team. And if this person is right or not maybe fitting perfectly, this can turn your work upside down totally. So the recruitment process is an example of decisions that affect your work. And sometimes it's outside of your, like, your, your kind of influence. So we thought about it. We thought about it that there are so many decisions. And these decisions are made by some groups of people. And we have teams. We have product teams. But if you look at this, there are groups of people making a decision, having an influence, having a goal. Well, if you look at these, these teams, these teams seem to be everywhere. There are not only product teams. There are groups of people that are making different decisions, working on some things that affect organization like in the horizontal, yeah? And these also are teams. And we should treat them as teams. So we created something which we call chapters. And this is not like Spotify chapters. This is something completely different. These chapters is a way to give these people who are working on a given topic, give them an ability to actually make this work right, to give them space, time, autonomy, everything. And this idea of chapters is that we, if we have a problem, and we have, the examples can be, like we have testing chapter, we have security chapter. Uh, Recruitment, we think, is kind of a chapter because there is a goal. Security chapter has a goal to improve security in our, all our applications, to improve our security at organizational level. The same for testing chapter, the same for recruitment. The goal of recruitment is to provide the best recruitment process that gives us the best candidates. So we thought about this, 
And if you think about it, there probably you can say that, well, these chapters, if you put the people together, for example, talking about security or, or talking about uh, testing, what's the difference between all these chapters and the simple community of practices, which are in almost every organization? Well, and I have to tell you, maybe I have a very wrong um, experience with community of practices, but for me, there's like a great difference. Because if you look at community of practice, it's, it's cool, but it's like a group of people just coming, going. If you like the topic, you come, you share some knowledge, you, get about, you go back to your team, and that's it. So the COP is not a team. And we want this chapter to be a team. We want them to be able to make changes. We don't want them to just share knowledge and go back to their teams. We want them to work on things, make decisions, and implement these decisions on an organizational level. So that's the difference I, I, I have. And for example, with recruitment team, our recruitment team is not just a bunch of guys asking questions, because that would be nothing. That's just someone set the process and they just ask questions. So how can they imp improve the recruitment in our organization? How can they improve the recruitment at Ocado? Now they can just execute the process, and that's not it. That's not, that's not forming a team. Our recruitment team can actually make any decision. They can change the recruitment process however they want. And they don't need to have any sign-offs, any approval, nothing. So let's wait a bit if this worked. Because the chapter number, sorry, not chapter, but the level number four is actually very much connected to this level. So first, let's give ourselves, of course, three stars in here, and let's move to level number four. So level number four, this is a desert. As you can see, there are flying bushes on the screen. I made them myself, as you can see. And I call this level the wind of change. Because we discussed about this chapter, we discussed about this making decisions, changing stuff, so it's time to actually implement some changes. But first, I have a small, let's say, a mind teaser for you. I wanted to ask you all a question, because the, this presentation is for leaders and for people who are planning to be leaders, but actually for everyone, because if you want to make any change, you are becoming a leader, naturally. If you want to do anything, you are becoming, you're leading some kind of a change. So my question for you is, what is our greatest responsibility as leaders? And no worries, I don't expect an answer. <laughs> I don't expect the answer because as many of you in here in this room, as many answers I would receive. But I wanted to share with you one answer that I particularly like, that I find very, very compelling. So I like to say that our responsibility as a leader is let your teams bloom. Because I like this comparison. I like to say when the team is like a flower, yeah? I mean, it might say cheesy, right? It would, be sound, it would sound much worse if I said a team is like a plant. <laughs> okay, let's say a flower. So if you have a flower at home, right? You, you cannot just like, I don't know, put it on the desk and tell to it like, now grow big and beautiful. It doesn't work that way, right? You cannot just say it. You have to take this flower, put it on a, in some sunny spot, you have to water it, you have to take care of it, you have to, I don't know, add some fertilizers, and then after some time, it grows, it blooms. So you have to create an environment for the team to grow. You cannot say, it, now you have to do everything, as, now you have to deliver everything, just do what your, your work is, I expect these results. It doesn't work like that. Just like with the flower, you have to build this friendly environment where the team can grow itself. And our responsibility as a leader is to allow that, to help that happen. So this is all what I'm saying, not telling what to do, but building an environment. This is autonomy. Autonomy that is super important. I, don't, I honestly believe that you cannot have a team. You cannot build a team without autonomy. Because without autonomy, you cannot make any experiments. Without autonomy, you cannot be creative. Without autonomy, you cannot innovate, simply. If you want to, your team to exist, you need to give them autonomy. If you're not giving them autonomy, there's, this is just a bunch of guys following your process. Nothing more. Autonomy is the key, especially in IT, when we are the creative business, so-called. So, autonomy. And as I said, autonomy means that a team simply must be able to make the change happen. The power needs to be in their hands because otherwise they won't achieve anything. And we learned it. I would say we learned it. Uh, organizations are changing. It's completely different than uh, a few years ago. We learned that autonomy is important, but the thing is that we learned it on projects level. We know that in projects, for example, if a team wants to use Spring or Juice, okay, let them choose. Usually that's fine, right? But the thing is, 
that this is just the project level. And I told you there is so much more in the organization that affects your work. So to truly succeed, we need to move this autonomy a bit higher. We need to move the autonomy. If you remember this, I said that we have teams everywhere. So we have to move this autonomy and give it to the teams, to all the teams we have. If we have a chapter who is making some kind of a decision, they need to have autonomy. If we have this, uh, I don't know, leadership team, they also should have the autonomy. If we have our recruitment team, which are going to talk about, we also need to give them autonomy. We need this autonomy at all levels in our organization. If we want to have teams, and we believe strongly that team is the one who is making the decision, the team is like the base unit in our organization. We won't achieve anything on our own. Sorry, guys, this is not the Wild West anymore when you can be a single cowboy doing all the changes. We are working in the teams. So if we have teams, if we identify teams in the organization, we need to give them autonomy everywhere, not just for the product teams, not in the, their product, at, but also for the teams that are not that obvious. So example again can be our recruitment team. I mentioned to you that at the recruitment team, we can make any decisions we want. So I've been at Ocado for three years, and I'm very much involved in the recruitment, because as I said, I think this is one of the most important things in the organization. And I don't remember how many times we changed something. The recruitment I passed is now kind of completely different. We are changing this. We are moving, removing obsolete sessions. We are adding new ones. We are changing the sessions we currently have. We are changing the questions. We are changing the exercises, everything. And we don't need anyone's approval. We don't need anyone's sign-off, because there is a trust from the management, from the entire organization, that we are making the right decisions. And if we want to change something, we are doing this. We don't have to ask questions. And if you want to have this team, you want to have autonomy, this obviously requires something because teams has needs. Just like in product teams, you have some needs. First, very simple need is that you actually need time to work together. And our recruitment team, for example, team of recruiters, team of technical interviewers, we have our time every two weeks, every week, depends how much time we need. We can sit down, and discuss recruitment topics. And then if we make some decision, we want to try something, we want to run an experiment or something like this, we have the autonomy to do that. Time for working together. But guys, even the simple things, we like party actually, so every team needs time for team building. We have team building of a product teams. Why we cannot have a team building for leadership team? Why we cannot have the team, uh, team buildings for chapters? Why we shouldn't have team buildings for recruitment team even? And we are doing this because, you know, one thing that is bringing value is building the relation and we can have actual teams working together, not only the product teams, but teams on a very different levels. Plus, well, every occasion to have a beer is cool, yeah? <laughs> Simple. So does it work? Yes, it does. It does for us. The recruitment team and the chapters, they're autonomous. They can make decisions and they feel they can influence very different things, like security standards. Usually, when, wherever I worked before, there was a big policy about security standards that you have to follow. Here, you set it up. If you are interested in chapter, you can join it and you can work together. You can make a decision and implement this decision at the organizational level. And that's perfectly fine. So it really works. It really, really works. So chapter number four, level number four, we is done. So we give ourselves far, three stars. And let's go to level number five, the final level. So this final level is really cool. It's like sunny place, perfect for holidays, sun, beach, sea. So all you need is just like a sun bath or a, and a drink in your hand. So you can have this. And I decided to call this level openness is happiness. And first I wanted to ask you, Open source initiative. How many of you is familiar with that? Raise your hand. Do you know open source? Do you use open source? I would be very surprised if there was no hand raised because, come on guys, this is IT conference, right? Uh, so the open source, let's, let's look a little bit about the, at that. So the open source, how the hell it works? Come on, everything is public. Everything is public. You can download any code you want. And what is crazy eh, is it's free. So it's public and it's free, so come on. Like, how come? And the second thing is that it's complete madness. In open source, you can actually contribute to anything you want, right? You want to be author of Spring, you download the Spring code, make changes, send it to the Spring guys, and they accept it or reject it. So you can contribute to anything you want. So sounds crazy, right? You have code, everything is public and free. You can contribute to anything you want. Sounds like madness. 
But still, if you look at open source tools, they are usually, or usually, they are very often much better than the commercial ones. And open source is growing and growing. So how this happens? Well, there are for me two big reasons why open source works. The first thing is wisdom of a crowd. Because if you have your idea, and this idea can be very good, this idea can be great, but there's a thing, and it took me a while to understand it, and probably, especially in the IT, it can take us some time to understand it, but guys, I'll share it with you, this, this small secret. It really took me some time to, under, to, 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 to learn it's true. We are probably not the smartest people in the world, okay? If we have our great idea, most probably there is someone in the world that can improve this idea, that can make it better. And our idea may not be the best. I know that that can be surprising, right? But it's true. <laughs> we are not the smartest. And it's hard to admit, it was very hard for myself, but it's true. We are maybe not the smartest ones. So if we have this idea and we open source it, we get this. We get this wisdom of a crowd, we get feedback, we have people collaborating with their ideas, sharing their knowledge, sharing their ideas, implementing this, and we can achieve more. And this wisdom of a crowd is a very powerful tool. And there's a second thing that for me open source really works, and this is the sense of ownership. As I said, you can contribute to Spring, right? And what happens if you do that? Like, there's the Spring framework, right? Everyone knows Spring. And you make a small contribution, you actually added two lines of code and it gets accepted. What happens then? You become the author of Spring, right? Oh, the Spring framework is thousands, hundreds, thousands of lines of code, but these two code, those two lines are mine. I'm the author of the Spring. You can now ask me any question, because this is my project. Because you get this sense of ownership. You contribute to it. You, you bond with this project. You, feel, you treat it as your own, and this is a very powerful motivator. And this is how open source works. This is why it grows so well. And I started to think, and we started to think at Ocado, and we are not that there yet, to be honest. I'm saying this true. This is something we want to achieve, we try to achieve, but we are not there yet. So we thought about it, mm, how about open source culture? How about this? Because there are so many decisions that are made, why we shouldn't make everything public? Why we shouldn't allow everyone to contribute to anything they want? It would sound interesting because in many organizations, if there are these big decisions, who makes the big decision? Big boss makes the big decision, yeah? This guy who's smoking cigar with his legs on the desk, this is the guy who's making the decisions, right? If there are pay reviews, if there are, I don't know, some processes to decide, so HR decision, hiring, whatever there is, there is a big manager, this Uber manager, and he makes the decision. Because he's not doing anything else, and everyone else has to work. But that's not true. When you actually become a leader, you start to see that um, we as leaders are pretty busy. It's not like we have time to make a decision. It's just in five minutes, we tell everyone what to do, and then we can go home. It doesn't really work like that. And for being busy and having too much on your plate, there's a simple solution, right? You can delegate. Simple as that. You can delegate stuff, but how delegation works and how it uses the benefit of the open source attitude? It doesn't at all, because if you delegate something, you delegate it to some person, some, so someone, or maybe even a team, and they make some kind of work, they make some kind of a decision, and that's it. How do you use wisdom of a crowd there? You're not using, you're not making it anyhow public, you just public this to some group of people, very narrow. So this doesn't give you the benefits of wisdom of the crowd. The second thing is how it works with sense of ownership. It doesn't work because if you delegate something, this is still this guy who de you delegate to will not feel anyhow connected or will not feel the, as the owner of this. This was yours, you just delegated. So it's not that, it's not enough. So we decided to do it a bit differently. So we created something which we called working groups. And working groups is, is a very simple thing. We have plenty of decisions to be made, sometimes very important ones. And we decided as a management team that why we should make these decisions. We are maybe not the smartest people in the world. And for managers, thinking that is even yet even harder. You know, for managers, this is very rare to admit that they are not the smartest ones. For developers, it happens, but for managers, never. <laughs> but we kind of, we thought, okay, we, maybe not, we are maybe not the smartest, we can share this. So we decided that if we have a difficult decision to be made that affects entire company, we decided, okay, 
Let's tell it to everyone. Let's tell, okay, guys, we need to make a, such a decision. We have to do some kind of a change. If you have something to say, if you want to contribute, come and, and make this decision. Do it with us, just like in open source. This is public. You can join and contribute. And guys, everyone is welcome. When we look out to, into our working groups, because it can sound very, very, you know, like epic, where it's like, oh, everything is public or so on, but the working group is consisting only managers. <laughs> it's like, not working. So everyone is welcome. If you are a junior who joined our company like a month ago, or you are a senior who is like 10 years with us, or I don't know, you are someone from HR, the HR lady, so-called, or you are a software ninja that is actually making changes in production environment with a root access, Everyone is welcome. If you feel you can contribute to this decision, come and join. Tell us what are your thoughts. Tell us about your ideas, because your ideas may be better than ours. And we want to make it public. We want to involve everyone. And we are pretty serious about that. We're pretty serious, because if you look at what kind of decisions we passed to working groups, the, the, this, sounds, this is not like, do we want this kind of coffee or this? And OK, you can make a decision. No. We are Giving, we, are we are sharing with the teams the actually very hard decisions that are really affecting our organization. If you, I can give you an example, we had a problem. We kind of did a survey and we, we, we learned that um, our career paths are not very clear. We don't know how to progress, what are the requirements for, for a promotion or something like this. So we had this. So we created a career working group that prepared entire, entirely new positions, job descriptions, a way of promoting expectations on each role, and we did this. And this was done by a career working group. And there were no managers discussing this. This was people from teams, people from different teams, different roles, different locations. They all sat together and tried to propose the best solution they can. They can. And we just implemented it. They, they asked at the end, they said, this is what we produced. Are you happy with that? Yeah, this is your decision, so let's implement it. The same with it, on-call support. Welcome support is super painful for people, right? And we have it. We work 24 hours a day, yeah? The shop works uh, all the time, so we need to support it. And on-call can be very painful. No one wants to get wake up, woken up in the middle of the night. And this was a problem. So we said, okay, let's think about it. How can we do it better? These are the constraints. This is the law. We cannot avoid, you, know, you, cannot, you, cannot, you have to be aligned with the law. So, there it is. This is the problem. Please find a solution. And we said to everyone, if you have an idea, how we, can we do it better? So the on-call is first legal, second, kind of convenient for people. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's prepare a solution and it's implemented. The same with the feedback for pay review. Very delicate t t topic, right? The money, pay raises. And we said, okay, our feedback tool isn't working. Let's prepare something different. Let's involve everyone. Let's say what they want to, how they want to give themselves a the feedback. So later on, a manager can make a fair decision giving a salary rise. And we did it. And now three teams in Wroclaw are experimenting with a new tool we prepared. And if it works, we will do this in our entire organization. So those are serious topics. And not managers are making these decisions, but the people. And we are not there yet, as I told you, but we are trying to do that. We are looking how it works. But as for now, it kind of works really well. The question, does it work? Yes, it works really well. Because if you are involved in the decision, you have the buy-in, you have commitment, you feel that this is your decision. And therefore, it's much easier to share this change in the entire organization. Because it's not the manager who comes to you and says, now we do it this way, thank you very much, be happy. No, this is your decision coming from, from the teams. So the question is, because this was level number five, does it all work? Yes, because all these practices are kind of improving the things we believe that are important, like collaboration, like trust, like autonomy. Those are our values. And these are practices that are trying to improve the level of these values in our organization. So we really think this works. Or should I reply with a memo or just say yes? I would simply say yes, 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 this works. And this is involving, this is engaging. And the fun, you may say that, ah, come on, I would never be able to do it in my organization. 20 people on an interview, what a waste of time and waste of money. Right? We pay these developers to write code, not to do interviews. Yes, it costs, it costs, but the cost of having an interview by a team where you put 20 people in the room, it's nothing compared to a cost of hiring bad manager because you start to lose people. And spending a day in a van Yes, it costs because this person is not coding. But the person understanding the business, then proposing better solutions, better ideas, 
This is a big value, and this cost of one day is nothing. Giving autonomy to the teams, giving them time, yes, it costs, but in the long term, it gives you much value. So all this, all these practices requires a lot of trust. You have to trust your people that they can make these good decisions, that you work with smart people, but come on, you recruit smart people. You want to work with people who are smart, who can make a change. So this requires a lot of trust. All the things I'm talking about require a lot of trust and not necessarily the money. They, they, are, they cost, they do cost, but this is not the thing. They don't require much money, they require a lot of trust. So level number five is done. Three stars, of course. And the question is what now? We finished the game. Yeah, we finished the game, so did we win, did we lose, what? And I say, this is not that simple. This is not that simple because if you look at building organizations, shaping a culture, building an organization, building a culture is not a game. You cannot pass some level, you cannot put some checks on the checklist and yeah, you are in a super great place. It doesn't work like that. Culture is something that is living, that is evolving and you have to put a lot of energy, a lot of your time and constantly work on it, improve it so it really, really works. And building organization is not that simple, it's not the game. I would say, I would like to compare it. I would compare it to kind of a journey. If you are building an organization, if you are building a culture, it's a journey. And this is a journey you go on with all your teams, with all the, all the people you work with. You go together and you are trying to find this, this great place, this sweet spot where everyone is happy, organization delivers everything, we have tons of money so we can spend it. This is the perfect place we are trying to look for. And our role as leaders, as we are on this journey with our people, our goal is to help these people to find the perfect place, not to tell them where it is. Our goal as leaders is not to say, this is how it should be done, we go that way, this will be good. No, we have to be there, help to, to go through the journey to all the people, and because guys, as I said, we are not the smartest ones. If you are going all together with your team, if you have some kind of ideas, there is plenty of people with you who probably have better ideas. And they can show you the speed, sweet spot you have never imagined. And then, where you actually get to this sweet spot, you get to this perfect place, you work in a team that is happy, you work in a team that is autonomous, you can do all the changes, you deliver, you, you achieve your goals, you are successful. This is the place where you are happy and this is the place you truly win. And I really wish you to be in that place. Work on your culture and be in that place. Because if you are in this place, then you actually win. And when you win, you get the trophy. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if you have any questions you want to discuss, then... Sure. Hi. Uh, Hi. So, uh, to the autonomy, uh, to, uh, in our organization, we have a little autonomy, but there is some big constraints. For example, uh, we use Jira as main organization does. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what is the, what are the, I don't know, uh, borders of the autonomy? So let's say one team says this workflow is completely cut. And the other team says, oh, this works great. We should use one. Yeah. How do you resolve conflicts? Yeah. Okay. Uh, good question. Good one. Um, one thing about autonomy. Autonomy has constraints, this is obvious. If you have autonomy without constraints, you have chaos. Everyone does whatever he wants and there's like no shared goal or anything. Then you, you're not even forming a team <laughs> if you don't see the same goal. Uh, so you have the constraints. And the question is who sets these constraints and why? Because this, oh, no, it was working. So because this, this constraints should be something that you agree as a teams all together. If this is something that you all share, you should agree with this all together. It cannot be like set. If you see that you should be using all Jira and this workflow because it, it's valuable, then yeah. But probably you have to be able to change it if it doesn't work. And this will be autonomy. Um, in example, for the, 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 I don't know how it's in your organization, but for us, uh, we, we don't have this problem about, for example, Jira. We have this, any team can use any tool actually they, they want because the goal is, the goal is and the constraints are that we have some, I don't know, do we have some goals? We have to deliver some stuff. And this is the thing. This is the constraint. The rest of this is 
job of a team. We say, okay, we want you to achieve this. How you do it, it's up to you. If you want to use Jira or you want to use Trello or you have to have a physical board and nothing, you know, like uh, no, no Jira at all, that's perfectly fine uh, because we don't need that. But for example, if you have Jira because we need to be transparent for our, our customers and with Jira, you can achieve that because you have well, well, you know, reports or anything like this you can easily share, that's fine, that's one of the constraints. But you as a team, in a team, you should be aware that this constraint exists and why it exists. Because if you don't see the constraints, that you, you will feel that this is not your decision and you're forced to do something. So th that would be my answer. Did I answer your question? <laughs> hey, yeah? So you always, you always ask, does it work? Yeah. My additional question would be, does it scale? Have you, have you had like, problems with scaling? Like, I, I don't know what, like, what is the number of employees that you have, for example. In entire navigation, it's um, 1,200. 1,200? So it's not, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's a good question. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, recruitment teams, they scale, but they, we don't scale it to entire organization level. We have this in location. So we have a recruitment team in every location because the market is different in Poland and in, I don't know, Barcelona, where we have the office. So we want them to be autonomous to make decisions. Uh, the working groups, this is something we want to achieve. We had some examples, but I would say, it, it's very hard to scale. Simply, you cannot involve everyone into everything, right? They want to contribute, but if you have 1,200 people, if 10% if of them want to contribute, probably you won't make any decision before they agree to anything, <laughs> yeah? So, so we are trying to give as much autonomy as you can, for example, to the locations, and then it's kind of a scaling up. We want to have some shared standards, but we want to have this kind of a local flavor in Wrocław, in Krakow, in Barcelona, in Sofia, and in Hatfield. And there, it can scale. The question is because in Krakow, we are 220, in Wrocław, we are 120, more or less. So these are not the big numbers. Uh, so, so it scales for now, but we are very carefully observing if this will be scaling further. Can I follow up a question, if I may? Yeah, sure. Short answer, do we have communication problems? All the time, <laughs> like everyone. Uh, we are trying to be transparent. Uh, we are trying to have some kind of like a way to visualize the, the things we are working. So we have, for example, an idea that we need to improve our uh, cycle time. And we have the so-called grand challenge. So for example, all the ideas we want to have, all the things we are working as a leadership team, and, and everyone can be involved, are just posted on the wall. So we can just see what's happening. Uh, we are trying to make some, I don't know, groups on Slack. If you are interested, join. We are making some kind of announcement, selling this to people. Now we are dealing with this problem, with this. If you want to be involved, please come. Uh, so, so we are trying some things which are very important. We are even over-communicating. So, so we are saying about this like three times, but we want to be sure that everyone hears the message. So, so, so uh, we have, of course, communication problems. And the bigger you are, the more communication problems you have. But you have to involve, you know, put energy and time into that because without communication, it's not, no, no, no success is going to happen. <laughs> OK, uh, any more questions? Yes? Uh, product teams or all the teams? Sorry? Um, I don't know. We can ask Piotrek and Kuba, who I'm working with. But I believe that, yeah, we give the same level of autonomy to all the teams. Uh, as I said, we give the same message. This is the goal. These are the constraints. The rest is up to you. So there is not like a, one team can use whatever tool they want, and the second team is said, OK, now you use Jira. Or now you use Scrum, and everyone else can use whatever they want. Uh, I don't know if you have any like, detailed uh, questions. Yeah, OK. Putting this that way, I would say, yes, we want to give all the same autonomy to all teams. But no, maybe not all the teams have the same level of autonomy at the given moment of time. Why? Because there are some more, let's say, new teams that are just forming. And maybe it's not the best moment to give them full autonomy. Because first, they need to understand and learn these constraints we have. 
They need to align with our goals. Then when you have alignment and you understand the constraints, then you can give more and more autonomy. And if you have teams that are mature and, and know everything, to be honest, there are teams that I have no idea what to do, the teams that I'm managing. And I have no idea what they're doing. And do I need it? No. Why? I know, I know they are doing the good well because I talk with POs. POs are happy. The teams are happy. I know that they are delivering. I'm talking with team leads, with people. If, if everything's fine, if I can help. If not, perfect. Then do your work. I have different topics to do, <laughs> different things to do, right? And, and they are quite happy. <laughs> the only feedback I get lately is that I'm not having coffee with them because I have like too many teams at the moment. <laughs> But I, I believe this is a good thing. When I was a developer, I was very happy when manager wasn't asking me a question, what I'm doing and why I'm doing this that way. <laughs> OK. Any questions? More? If not, I'll be somewhere around here, probably near the Okado stand. I'm, I'm somewhere there. If you want to have a chat or, or, or about this or about Okado or anything else, feel free to be invited and grab a coffee there, uh, and I'll be happy to chat with you. Uh, once again, thank you very much, then.